You know, sometimes whenever you give a presentation, everything goes perfectly, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, this little quick force velocity profiling tutorial is a result of uh, not having it go well at the uh, NSCA 2022 Coaches Conference. So my apologies to those who were sitting there, and the, uh, the instructions were not uh, clear because they just, uh, man, I don't know what happened. Uh, but, you know, that's such as life. Uh, just for a quick review for those who were there, and if you weren't there, this is the first time. Um, what is force velocity profiling? It's just a visualization of how athletes use both force and velocity to produce power. Because power really is a fluff metric, so we really need to mm -hmm. kind of figure out more about it before we uh, are going to make um, decisions right, on the training. Typically, you uh, chart force on the, uh, you know, you can chart force on the Y, velocity on the X, and chart power on a uh, additional Y, or you can cho uh, chart force on the X, velocity on the Y. You know, it, it depends. There's some, <clears throat> there's been some recent debates in the past um, year, year and a half about what to put where. Uh, so, you know, I don't think there's anything finalized there. Uh, why not just look at power? Now, it's because I mentioned it's a fluff metric. And by fluff, I don't mean uh, that it's meaningless. What I mean, uh, I, I took that term from Jason Lake, and I loved it. So I thought, hey, you know, I'm just going to keep saying it. Uh, but it, it's a calculated variable. It's the product of force and velocity. Uh, so, you know, if we have a power that uh, it, I'm using random numbers here, just throwing this out there to make a, a story, and, and you'll see the dichotomy, that let's say my power is 500 watts. Okay. Well, my force could be, you know, 10 newtons and my velocity could be 50 meters per second or force could be 50 uh, newtons and velocity could be 10 meters per second. So I could be definitely achieving that same peak power far to the velocity into the spectrum through speed or far to the force into the spectrum through my absolute strength abilities. Now, by breaking the, apart the components, you can tell where they're sufficient and deficient. And, you know, if you followed a lot of the work of J.B. Moran, you already know how to do this. But uh, and if you aren't familiar with them, get familiar with them. Uh, he does a great job of explaining these things and uh, is one of the people that turned me on to this many years ago uh, after I was doing the load velocity and then looking at the force velocity and like exercise selection things. He did a great job of it. Uh, <clears throat> now, if you don't want to do the full force velocity profile like through Marin uh, with the San Mazzino method, I understand uh, that one's great for through the use of apps and other things. Now, it might not work with your program and how you do things. Uh, something that I propose is that if you are doing a 1RM or strength test anyways, and it could be a 5RM or, or whatever it happens to be, if we can add some ballistics uh, to the velocity of the spectrum, so before we start our heavy lifts, we can find a pretty good uh, force velocity profile all the way through. Now, the method that I am describing is something that I've done with the baseball team and some of the other teams here at the University of Miami. And essentially what we do is uh, we add, we, we adapted the Shepard method towards the exercise that we're doing. Uh, Jeremy Shepard, uh, in this paper, he looked at, uh, I believe it was national level and regional level volleyball players, or maybe it was professional and you know, whatever it was, it was volleyball and they're differentiating between the two. Uh, but uh, essentially what Jeremy did was instead of a five load or eight load as is common, he did an unload, a jump with an unloaded condition, okay, and they were all paused, right? So uh, it's like, why do I pause there? Uh, because we want to look at the force velocity capabilities rather than the ability to use a stretch shortening cycle. And not that it isn't important, but it's not germane to what we are looking at here, okay? So Jeremy did unloaded 25% and 50% of body weight. And I believe he did the uh, squat jump exercise. And by nature, remember, and this is something I think coaches don't uh, get quite as much, you know, squat jump versus jump squat, they're two different movements. Jump squat indicates that there is no pause at the bottom. Saying squat jump indicates that there is a pause at the bottom. And that gets confusing. And uh, I, I still to this day, you know, if I'm not uh, with it and not well caffeinated, speaking of which, I'm going to mess that up. Right. So here's what I proposed. We took uh, for the uh, the athletes here, they were doing trap bar deadlift. And what we did was we instituted this 
with the trap bar deadlift. So I set up a PVC, par, uh, PVC pipe bar, uh, you know, 24 inches by 24 inches square, put the uh, tether to the front, I was using a gym wear, and start, put measured to where the high handle height would be uh, whenever we had a, a standard, um, uh, oh my gosh, can't think of the term, so let me get uh, more caffeine. That did it. Bumper plate. Yep. Uh, the little spurt there was because I could remember, oh yeah, it's called a bumper plate. So we loaded it up to where the uh, height of the bumper plate would place the top handles. We put a box there so that they would be going, uh, well, two boxes, so it would be supported uh, so that they could be able to, you know, uh, lift from that height and have them jumped up in the air, come down, set the PVC pipe down uh, and uh, hold that position for count of three, jump up again. Then we went up to uh, uh, typic what typically Jeremy would do, and if I have the ability to do this, I'll go to a 25% and a 50% body weight load. Uh, otherwise, I'll go to as close as I can uh, get to those. Uh, and, and what do I mean as close as I can? Well, if I, uh, for instance, some of our trap bars over here weigh 60 pounds. So to get to 25%, uh, somebody would have to be 240 pounds. So we just, we don't have a bar that, that does that uh, for some of the, you know, some instances. So that's that's what I'm meaning is I want to get as close as I can uh, at that 25 and that 50 percent body weight. And I look at the force, velocity and power for those movements right there. And then I immediately just go into the warm ups, the warm up set. So I'm just taking about three to five minutes probably uh, before we do the one rim test. And it gives us tons more information. So how do we do it? That's just what I mentioned. Okay. Uh, and if you do things like a squat that naturally has that eccentric concentric in it, you're going to have to pause at the bottom. Okay. I said that before I'm saying it twice, cause it's extremely important. Here's what's going to happen. Somebody is going to be doing this, uh, and they aren't going to pause on a squat, uh, excuse me, on a jump squat. I just said it wrong myself on a squat jump. They aren't going to pause at the bottom. And then the numbers are not going to make sense whenever they compare it with the one RM data. Well, it's because we're getting, the stretch shortening cycle activation from the unloaded conditions. Uh, but we don't really get that with the loaded conditions, with the heavier loads. Now, why is that? You're not going to dive bomb and go down super fast with a heavy load. You're going to have it under control. And since that stretch shortening cycle uh, requires a high speed eccentric, you're not engaging it. So we need to make sure that we're keeping it the same all the way through. Uh, so there's a couple of methods that, you know, the, the, the basic ones there, uh, tools that you can use, man, it doesn't matter, right? You can use a linear position transducer, an accelerometer, uh, opto jump, a jump mat, the my jump app. I put JB Marin on there. It's Carl, Carlos Balsabore. Uh, that, that's a, a major brain fart right there. Uh, but it is using his method, the San Bazzino method, uh, embedded into that, uh, that app. So that's something that, you know, th these are all lower-ish costs. You don't have to have force plates to do this. Uh, so, you know, these are the two main ways that people do it, in addition to the third one that I proposed here. Uh, utilize the mean, uh, the mean or mean propulsive. We're not using peak velocity here. Uh, pick the best repetition for the f from the set. Best in terms of what? Best in terms of velocity. Uh, or, you know, jump height if that's what you've got. Uh, make sure to use the same repetition for all three variables. Uh, don't pick the highest force, the highest velocity, and the highest power if they're three separate reps. Uh, chances are they're not going to be ever, but, I mean, there's standard error occurs. So we want to make sure that we're not just uh, taking an error rep or taking the best rep. And then that actually kind of goes in with this. Tools, yeah, you can use anything you want, but make sure it's valid and reliable. Uh, just because you bought something doesn't mean it's accurate, right? Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and it's like, how do I know if it's accurate and reliable and valid and reliable? Excuse me. Uh, there's some papers out there by Amador Garcia Ramos. And uh, he, hopefully I said his name correctly and that he has done on the uh, you know, validity and reliability of uh, different units as well as I believe it's, uh, it was either Jonathan Weekly or Harry Banyard or Harry Dorrell, uh, one of the two Harrys or, or Jono uh, that has re done one even more recently with a few of the uh, newer devices. Uh, plot, you can use whatever you, you prefer. 
uh, Excel. It can be a little tricky, but I'm going to show you how to do it. Uh, Sigma plot R with Tableau, uh, and actually R, it's uh, R Studio, and they, whatever. Patrick Ward showed me how to do it, and uh, uh, he, he did a really good job of it, and actually it's on his website if you want to go check that out, uh, especially for his Tidy Tuesdays. It, man, it was like two years ago. Uh, and there's, dude, if you can plot stuff in it, you can, uh, in, in that software, you can do a force velocity profile with it. So here's some Excel directions that I'm going to walk you through here in a momentarily. And I'm going to put them up on this other screen over here uh, that doesn't have video recording software on it, which is why I'm using my laptop. Uh, and uh, I'm going to walk you through step by step. Okay. So now I'm going to pull up some data. Uh, this is from a baseball player. Uh, I've got 0, 30, 70, and 100% of 1RM uh, put on. Now, uh, you'll see that those directions, they're actually for uh, not 100% uh, to us. And to say that they were 100% accurate isn't, uh, isn't there either. Um, uh, Uh, sorry about that. I just happened. I was looking at the data and I'm like, hey, wait a second. I don't think that's right. Uh, I need to change these. That's the uh, force numbers and this is the power numbers. So I've got my data uh, here that I pulled, exported from Excel and, and did all that. So I went ahead and I went and chose that. Now, again, uh, you'll see like the uh, first one that you see power equals load times velocity. Well, uh, that's a technically that's momentum right and uh, that was for use in one of our labs uh, and um, and they were taking it from some Kaiser equipment so you know don't don't worry about that part and that's dude that's not correct I do I get it I am the uh, momentum guy now as well as being the velocity guy so I you know whatever uh, mistakes happen and uh, I took this from uh, from a lab so uh, let's let's get past that part and, and get to the nitty gritty. Uh, in Excel, organize your data so it looks like this. Uh, the x-axis data should be in the first column. So if we wanted to do percent of one RMs to line everything up, that's normalizing to load. And uh, that's normalizing to the percentages of four. So, you know, you can look at it one way or another. Uh, sometimes I'll, with mass groups of teams, um, I'll normalize to that 0, 30, 70, and 100 percent of one RM. Uh, and, and why did I choose those numbers? This was retrospective testing. So I tried to, uh, we won't even get into that. Let's just get to the part that matters. So highlight the data in these first three columns, including the headings. Select insert. Select insert, come on. Let's come on over here, there we go. And now we are going to uh, select a scatter but I want the scatter with the lines, okay? Uh, you know what, actually, I'm gonna hold off on the lines for right now. I'm just gonna select a regular scatter because I wanna do the lines separately. Now, it's like, whoa, what is this? That looks crazy. How come velocity is zero the whole time? Ah, young one. This is, because, this is why it gets a little tricky. So now, we need to right click on the dots for power. Right click, okay. Now. You are going to see the select format data series. I just updated Excel and it looked a little bit different to me. I'm not used to seeing the little paintbrush there. Format data series. And then we're going to want to plot that on a secondary axis. Okay. Now, click right click on the this again now we're going to add a trend line now it's like wait a second what is that well this is giving it a first order or linear regression well we're actually a second order right so if i i just hit the wrong thing add trend line And we want to go here, not to the logarithmic, even though you're like, oh, that's curvilinear. That's, that's what this is supposed to look like. Go to a polynomial. And we're going to go to a, poly a polynomial and a, uh, a second order uh, polynomial. I was trying to show you what a logarithmic would look like, but man, 
uh, it, it didn't work out, and that that's okay. But whenever we make it a second order polynomial, well, then that's going to uh, that's giving us a curvilinear relationship essentially. Um, so now, what do I do? I look uh, over here, and I am going to right click on the dot here. Now, I want to add a trend line. I'm going to go ahead and make it exponential. Okay. And there we go. We've got our force, I'm sorry, our, our load velocity curve and our power load curve. And they're matching up. So we can see that this individual happens to hit peak power at 60%. Well, where do we want them to hit, be hitting peak power at? Well, uh, they're hitting it where they hit. And typically you'll see that on a uh, squat or deadlift exercise, it happens between 30 and 60, 30 and 70 percent. This individual happens to be at 60 percent. Knowing that the better athletes in the sport of baseball happen to hit it a little bit sooner, you know, around 30 or 40 percent, we're going to want to give this individual, uh, we're going to want to overdo it, just slightly overshoot it on speed with them. Okay, so uh, peak power typically happens at about a meter per second, and we can see uh, you know, that, uh, that for this individual it happened about 60%, and that would be about 0.8 meters per second, uh, judging from here. Uh, it's like, how do you know that? Well, every 5% is about you know, 0 0.06 meters per, uh, 0.06 meters per second. So that would put it about 0 0.77, 0 0.8 meters per second. And that's what we typically see at 60%. Kind of funny how those load velocity relationships, even though they're individualized, they usually come out to be about the same. Uh, but this is just a quick way to be able to do it for you. Now you want to make it a little prettier. You can do all the stuff that you want. You know, you can make it a uh, athlete, a FVP or load VP or whatever. Now, let's say we want to actually do a uh, force velocity profile instead of a load velocity profile. So now what we'll do is we're going to cut this. We're going to insert the cut cells here. And we are going to highlight these three. Insert. Scatter again. Come here. Right click. Format data series. Secondary axis. Right click again. Add trend line. Second order polynomial. Right click here. Add trend line. Exponential, boom. Now, if we wanted to be able to get their prediction equation, we can. Now, let's see, we come back up here, we right click on that, uh, we're trying to format trend line. And then same spot that we were at. Just scroll all the way down. Display equation on chart. Display squared R value on chart. And that's everything that you would need. So this equation is going to, is your predictive equation for that individual. And that's telling you what the strength of it is. R squared equals 0.993. Uh, so hopefully you found this somewhat helpful, somewhat useful. Um, and, uh, and this will clear up the uh, holes that existed within the presentation uh, at the NSCA that we didn't go over that. All right. Thank you all.